Hey, Cypher here. Due to recent events, I had to attend a conference digitally, and therefore had a conference paper that I had to deliver through YouTube. So that's what today's episode is. It's a conference paper that I delivered talking about the scholarly value of YouTube. YouTube seems to be fairly neglected when it comes to new media and the public history profession. While it might be seen as a place to upload documentaries or something along those lines, or to publicize a museum, it isn't really seen as a place to do public history in and of itself. And I'm hoping that today, I can show a few ways in which it is in fact a pretty good way of doing public history. Not just in terms of posting, but in terms of actually being a mode of public history in and of itself. Now, a bit about me, I run a YouTube channel called The Cynical Historian, which has uh, about 105,000, 108,000 subscribers, something along those lines. So I reach a pretty wide audience. On the channel, I use a pseudonym, by the name Cypher, and actually I'm in the process of developing multiple characters on the show. It's a whole thing. But I do use it as a form of public outreach, as a way of doing public history. Now I don't want to make it sound like everything on YouTube is hunky-dory. There's a lot of problems. But we can overcome them by having more and more of the public history profession accepting it as a legitimate form of scholarship because there's just a whole lot of different benefits that we're really missing out on by not having so many historians on the platform. First, there's the fact that it's just really easy to publish anything. While there are a lot of things that you have to get used to in terms of technology, the publication process itself is very easy on YouTube. Sure, you will probably have to invest in you know, a microphone, a camera, lighting, maybe some sort of set design, any number of things, and especially the software as in Premiere Pro, which is what I use. But once you have all of that stuff, it's very easy to slap together an episode and put it up online. So the barrier to entry is actually pretty low. It really just takes a little bit of technological savvy. And with that ease of publication, there's a bunch of benefits that come from that. For instance, you can really experiment with what you're talking about for future projects. Oftentimes, I will slap together an episode as like a preliminary before launching into a bigger project. So you get the experience of putting something together and putting it out there. It's a publication before doing anything for more serious and academic work. And given the low barrier to entry, it also means you can do a lot of things that like TV stations such as PBS wouldn't fund otherwise. Network executives tend to be a bit short-sighted and not willing to fund efforts of like local history. But you don't need network approval to make documentaries for YouTube. It also means that you can more regularly rely on fair use. One of the constant problems with doing any kind of publications through some sort of big network such as PBS is that you have to get all kinds of copyrighted work approved. If you have a painting that happened to be made in the 19th century, it might be owned by a museum and so the network might not want to show that painting because some museum owns the painting itself, even though it's well outside of copyright. There's also the fact that you can use works for educational purposes, and that's what's called fair use. If you're transforming it by using it for education purposes, or if you're critiquing it in any way, that means that you can actually use it to specifically do those purposes. Now, YouTube has its own copyright system with many, many problems with it, but the fact is, it is not as restrictive as doing any kind of documentary work for television. Included in that publication is also something that television can never do, as in metadata. You can include metadata that strengthens the work itself. In YouTube, there is a description, which means that you can say what the work is about and 
have your bibliography in there, or anything along those lines, so that you can add supplementary material that wouldn't be included in a television show outside of having it inside the DVD's sleeve or something along those lines. But you can't include that on screen. Now I think having a bibliography or a way that people can check your sources is integral to promoting good scholarship. And with the description, you're able to do that. There's also pinned comments, which is basically, as you can see at the bottom, there is a comment section. As the creator of a video, you are able to pin a comment to the top of that comment section, which is often your own comment, so that you can list errata. Normally, you can't go back and fix errors unless you make a new edition of a book or a documentary or anything along those lines. Even in a museum, it is often very difficult to explain away errors that might happen. But on YouTube, with that pinned comment, you can literally timestamp the places where you have made an error and then list what the error is, perhaps giving a source as to why you made that error and how people can further research it. And while we'll get to how bad a comment section can get, that comment section is also a very useful tool for scholarship. On this platform, as you publish more and more, you can actually build a reputation. And as such, you build a community. Especially from my community, I often ask things from the commenters so that I can find out something that I might not know, or wait for them to correct me on something that I might not have realized was an error. Between the presenters on this panel, we have about 300,000 subscribers, 40 million views, and thousands upon thousands of comments. Many of those comments can be very constructive, and even the particularly nasty ones can show where there's uh, particular pressure points in society. YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world, only seconded by its parent company, Google itself. So there's plenty of room for growth. Worldwide, there's about 2 billion active users, which is about 20% of the entire population of the Earth. 73% of US adults use YouTube. It's the most trafficked video platform on the internet, including Netflix. And more people watch videos on YouTube than they do of television. And part of the reason for that popularity is that it's a video platform where anybody can put videos up, which is its ultimate strength. And that means that it's a visual medium. Since we aren't doing this at the actual conference site, I can show you this is a green screen. I can change the background all I want. And there's a load of things that you often wouldn't be able to do on television and whatnot that really add to the scholarly value of this visual medium. For instance, you can show on-screen text, as in actually the thing that you're quoting or something along those lines, which to anyone who's given a speech before, you know that having to quote something is often hard to differentiate from what you're talking about. But on YouTube, you just show the text on screen. And included with that text on screen, you can also include footnotes, which means that you can make a video about as scholarly intensive as publishing a journal article or something along those lines, except for there's even further stuff because you can actually show primary sources and artifacts. Oftentimes when I'm quoting something, I will just take a PDF of the thing that I'm quoting and then show that on screen and highlight the piece that I'm quoting. That allows me to show the context of the quote beyond just the quote. Or for instance, one time I used a letter from a Spanish governor of New Mexico, and obviously I was translating it, so I could show the original letters from the 18th century superimposed with the text in which I am quoting and the footnote. You can run through these things rather quickly because the audience has the ability to pause. On YouTube, you can expect that people know how to pause a video. So if a footnote flashes by really quickly, on television that wouldn't be acceptable, but on YouTube, that's standard. And finally, something that most texts will never be able to do is that you can visualize what's being said. It's beyond just having a picture in the corner, you can actually cut in footage of what you're talking about. 
As many people in the public history profession like to make fun of Ken Burns for his slow zoom on pictures, it is a bit of a necessity for a visual medium, though on YouTube you can cut between many, many pictures and not have to worry about fatiguing people's eyes. In fact, that is somewhat expected. But there are many problems that come with having so much freedom. There's a bunch of topics that don't fit a visual medium. For instance, I wanted to do an episode based on my master's thesis, which was about violence and vigilantism in San Luis Obispo County, California. While sure, I could show pictures of people being lynched or something along those lines, one, you don't exactly want to actually see these things, and two, showing pictures of the landscape as it is, as opposed to how it was, are two very different things. So making some sort of short clip about it would be prohibitive in terms of what I could show. There's also a necessity on YouTube of making it somewhat entertaining. While I'm sure many of us think that museums are actually pretty entertaining, the fact is most people do not consider museums to be particularly entertaining. Learning to be entertaining is a task in and of itself. On YouTube, the audience is easily bored. That's why on YouTube, you've seen me doing these jump cuts. You can literally see me doing the cuts. This is based on the necessity that we have to move very quickly through our material, otherwise the audience will get bored. And as an unfortunate side effect of that, you can't really do very deep explanations unless you can make it particularly entertaining. On average, my videos lose about 40% of the audience within 10 seconds. And maintaining a good viewer retention average is important in terms of being promoted within the platform, because there is a lot of competition. Journalists, much as they always do, have managed to get onto this platform far quicker than historians. And unlike in the past where the profession has been able to rely on the austere nature of museums and academia, we have to compete with journalists directly. And YouTube itself is actually promoting many journalists because they are part of bigger companies and YouTube favors bigger companies. The trending tab, which is where many people discover new content, is particularly biased towards promoting big companies. And the fact is, journalists can normally never really be good historians, because their interpretations are problematic to say the least. But YouTube historians must compete openly with these biases. Then there's the community itself, because comments are famously nasty on YouTube. There is an insane amount of bigotry on this platform, especially in the comments section. Now you'll find various philosophies among YouTubers on how to deal with that. For instance, I keep a blocked word list, which means anybody using particular words have to be approved by me, and it's designed to catch all the bigots. The platform itself has been the center of a great deal of scandals on that, especially with the rise of Gamergate in 2014. Anti-SJWs, as they call themselves, became the foundation of the alt-right. And since these videos go out to a global audience, you'll often find some kind of craziness in the comments that you would never have expected and learn about all the weird ideology that exists outside of the narrow confines of our profession. It's part of the reason why I use a pseudonym on the channel. I am threatened all the time in my comments section. I use a pseudonym for many other reasons than that. The fact is, threats are kind of just something you have to deal with on the internet. Of course, beyond the user base itself, YouTube as a platform has many serious problems in terms of its scholarly value. YouTube has been in the throes of what's called the adpocalypse for about three years now. In order to prevent videos from running ads that may cause ad providers to pull their ads from the platform, they will what's called demonetize a video. This means that they pull ads from the video. And while demonetization may be seen as just taking away money, it is also suppression. YouTube itself has made several official statements to the contrary, but there is a great deal of anecdotal evidence to show that when a video is demonetized, it is quickly demoted within the algorithm and no longer a competitive video. Almost every YouTuber who has dealt with demonetization can show statistics to contradict YouTube's official statements. And where this gets particularly bad is that demonetization somewhat attacks historical content. 
their ad policy specifically states that a video can be demonetized for controversial issues and sensitive events. Controversial issues refers to topics that may be unsettling for our users and are often the result of human tragedy. A sensitive event is usually an unforeseen event in which there has been a loss of life. An event must be relatively recent if it's going to be considered a sensitive event. Historical events are generally allowed to monetize if presented within the context of a documentary or historical debate. And while they have that historical event part of their policy, they violate that constantly. I have about 30 videos that are demonetized, and they are all about historical events. And as such, they also are not getting the kind of views than I would have expected otherwise. Plus, all of these policies can change fairly randomly. For instance, back in 2010, YouTube changed its algorithm to favor watch time over the amount of views, which meant that a bunch of channels that made short videos, but not as often, were penalized because they couldn't produce that kind of content. This is why a bunch of animation channels left in 2010. It's also the reason why the Let's Play genre came about. Luckily, history kind of falls perfectly in that happy medium where we can talk at length and have regular content. But of course, these policy changes are enforced retroactively. There are community guidelines, as in videos that violate these community guidelines may be taken down. And a recent change in community guidelines took down a very famous video called Content Cop that had been up on the platform for years and was a fairly important part of YouTube history. All of it because they put out a new definition of something that violated community guidelines in 2020, whereas this thing was from years prior. So retroactive enforcement makes all of this extremely arbitrary. And especially when it comes to community guidelines, history is particularly targeted. Another channel called The Casual Historian had his video on Holocaust deniers taken down for Holocaust denial, even though the video was a documentary on Holocaust denial, specifically exposing the problems of that form of hatred. Now they did apologize for taking it down, but the re-upload of this video is still being targeted. And I have had a number of videos um, targeted that way as well. Plus, with all the bigotry within the user base, they can mass flag a video and have it taken down. For instance, if you make a video like I made about the movie The Promise and the Armenian Genocide, I had a bunch of people from Turkey mass flagging it because they were genocide deniers. The video was demonetized and flagged for community guidelines, both of which managed to go through manual review correctly, but YouTube often goes the other way, and there's really no way of making sure that they enforce their own guidelines correctly, or trying to argue against those guidelines where they affect the history profession in a negative way. So the problems of all this are quite daunting, but historians as a profession can overcome them. As more historians join the platform, we legitimize the platform as a place to do history publicly. And as I explained before, there is a wealth of good to be gained from doing YouTube public history. There's easy publication, the fact that it's a visual medium, direct community interaction, building a reputation, and just the general popularity of the platform itself. While new media is a new frontier for the public history profession, we may only fight off the problems by having more and more historians participating in it.